like it because the fetus is a human person with rights, including the right to life. That's the fundamental right. If you don't have life, you can't have liberty. Or maybe the fetus is not a person. Maybe the pro-choicer is right. At least the pro-choicer who denies the first premise of the three-premise pro-life argument. Maybe the fetus is something less than a human person. Maybe it's human but not a person. Maybe it's a person without rights. But it's not the full thing that the pro-lifer thinks it is. All right, those are two possibilities in objective fact. But here's the key to the argument. Let's factor in the subjective consciousness here. And let's not just talk about belief, but let's talk about knowledge. Because it's not belief, but knowledge that gives you responsibility. You either know what a fetus is or you don't. You're either skeptical, and you say, I don't know whether it's human or not, or you don't know. All right, so there's four possibilities. The fetus is a person and you know it. The fetus is not a person and you know that. The fetus is a person and we don't know that. Excuse me, the fetus is not a person and you... <laughs> you see them up there. Either the fetus is a person and you know it, or it's a person and you don't know it, or it's not a person and you know it, and it's not a person and you don't know it. What is abortion in each of these four cases? Well, if the fetus is a person with rights, including a right to life, and you know that, and you nevertheless deliberately choose to kill it, that's the definition of murder. And if it's premeditated, that's first-degree murder. Oh, but it's such a small person. Haven't you read your Dr. Seuss? Horton hears a who. A person's a person no matter how small. Ah, but what if the fetus is not a person? Does that make abortion okay? Well, if you know that, yes. If the fetus is not a person and you know that for sure, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with abortion. It's, it's an operation. It's, it's excising some cells. And I've often honestly confessed that I would find it rather relieving if some pro-choice philosopher could prove to me, to my satisfaction, that we can know that the fetus is not a person. Then we could just give up and go home and agree to disagree and pack up. And we wouldn't have to have such expenditure of time and money and energy and worry about this whole question. That would make it a lot easier. But I've never seen it done. Never. So only if this thing were done that I've never seen done is abortion okay. Because suppose you don't know what a fetus is. Let's look at the other two possibilities. You don't know that a fetus is a person, but in fact it is. Well, that's the don't shoot principle. You don't know that it's not a person. You don't know what it is. You shoot it anyway. You run over the coat. You shoot the leaf moving in the tree. And it, it happens to be your fellow hunter. Oh, I didn't mean to kill him. Yeah, but did you wait to see that that was a deer instead of your hunter? No, I didn't know what it was. And you shot anyway? You have killed a man. That's manslaughter. It's not first degree murder. You didn't intend murder. But you have killed a man. And you are responsible for that. That's a very serious crime. Well, suppose the fetus is not a person. Ah, but you don't know that. Suppose the Supreme Court is right. We don't know what a fetus is. And suppose the pro-choicers are right in saying a fetus is not a person. Even so, that's criminal negligence. You're just lucky. It happened to be a deer, but you didn't know that. It happened that there were no students left at Georgetown when you fumigated. You didn't know that. It happened that that was a cleverly disguised robot, not a human being that you killed walking into the room. But you didn't know that. That's certainly morally reprehensible. I don't know how to get out of that quadrilemma. The usual move that the pro-choice philosopher makes at this point is to say that just because the fetus is genetically and biologically a member of the human species, and just because it has its own individual distinct genetic code, even as a blastocyst, that doesn't mean that it's a person with rights. Yeah, it's a human being, but it doesn't have rights. Ah, well, then we have two very simply and clearly different philosophies of rights. Either all humans have rights or some humans have rights. Logically, it's got to be one or the other. If only some humans have rights, then some don't. And if you can label those humans that don't have rights, including the right to life, that justifies your killing them. The history of that second philosophy is rather dark. 
It includes Dred Scott, which said blacks are not fully human because they're property. Whites own property. They have a right to property, uh, and therefore they have legal rights. But since blacks are property and property can't have rights, Dred Scott must be returned to his owner. So whites have rights and blacks don't. Nobody wants to say that except to justify slavery. Or when the Nazis began their eugenics program, it was based on this famous book by the German doctors called Life Unworthy of Life. Look at these severely retarded people. Look at these imbeciles. Look at these mental idiots. How could you say that they have a right to life? It would only be compassionate to kill them. One of the most famous American jurists in history, Oliver Wendell Holmes, bought into some of that philosophy when he justified the Virginia compulsory sterilization law by using language that looked like it was copied from that book. And uh, Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, has also not only personally friendly with the Nazis at the time, but said things very similar to that, including racist things like more babies from the fit and fewer for the unfit. Well, this may shock us, but if you believe that only some humans have rights, it shouldn't logically shock you. The only way to overcome the shocking immorality of such actions is by philosophy one rather than two, to say that all humans have rights and not just some. In history, only when you want to do something bad to some human beings do you relabel them. Well, since rights come from persons, since persons have rights, uh, let's talk about the same thing in terms of persons. Many philosophers that are pro-choice argue, <sighs> yes, they're human beings, but they're not persons. Only some human beings are persons with rights. Those that are fully functional, those that are adult, those that are rational, those that can interact with others, those that can contribute to society, those that you can recognize, those that are wanted, whatever the standard. A line is drawn between those human beings that do have a right to life and those human beings that do not have a right to life. And that line is always drawn by a human being who is alive and therefore powerful and has the power of life and death over this other human being who can be killed. So either all humans are persons or some humans are persons. I believe that all humans are persons. I believe the category of person is larger not smaller than the category humans. As a Christian, I believe that God is three persons. I also believe that angels are persons, persons without bodies. I also believe that it's possible that there are extraterrestrial persons of other species, biological species, but they're rational, they have self-consciousness, they have free choice and therefore moral responsibility. So E.T. is a person, whether he's real or fictional. But the pro-choice philosophy reverses that and says, no, only some humans are persons. The category person is a subdivision of humanity. It's smaller than humanity, not larger. To smoke out these positions this way, to state them that boldly and clearly, is at least a necessary preliminary to debating them. Two of my four arguments, I think, namely the three-step essential pro-life argument and the quadrilemma are not just clarifications but arguments. The other two are clarifications. If you want a complete, carefully worked out, well, fairly carefully worked out argument, read my book, Three Approaches to Abortion. The first essay is entitled The Apple Argument from Abortion, in which I argue from the premise that we know what an apple is to the conclusion that all human beings have a right to life. And I find in conversation and in reading that pro-choicers who do not believe that a fetus has a right to life usually back up to some step in the argument where they have to deny either that we know what an apple is or that we really know what an apple is or that we really know what an apple really is or that we really know what some things really are or that we know that what human beings are or that we know that we have human rights because we have human beings in other words, that morality is based on metaphysics. Metaphysics is simply the science of being or thinking about being. It's not a woo-woo science, except in Southern California. <laughs> no, seriously, the bookstores in California uh, put metaphysics under a subdivision of witchcraft. <laughs> but, 
But metaphysics is simply thinking about what is. I don't think there's a very strong pro-life argument without metaphysics. I don't think there's a very strong moral argument for anything without metaphysics. Because the basic moral rule, it seems to me, is the three R rule, right response to reality. Why is it wrong to torture a pig? Because a pig has feelings. Oh. Why is it not wrong to torture a tulip? Because a tulip doesn't have feelings. Oh. Uh, Why is it wrong to kill a bald eagle? Well, because a bald eagle is in danger of extinction. Why is it okay to kill a mosquito? Because a mosquito is not in danger of extinction. You see, in each case, we're giving an argument in terms of metaphysics because of what it is. So why is it wrong to kill an innocent human being who is not threatening your life? Well, because of what a human being is. What's that? Is a human being simply what society says it is or what you want to say it is? Is it your will and your power that defines a human being or is it nature that defines a human being? You don't have to assume God. I don't think the argument against abortion depends on religion. I think atheists like Bernard Nathanson see this very clearly. As long as you're not a total skeptic, and even the skeptical argument counts against abortion, you can believe that human nature exists and we can know something about it, and that grounds human values. Human beings have human values because they're human. And different kinds of people have different rights and different duties because they're differently human. For instance, parents have parental rights because they're parents. They have, for instance, the right to forbid their 17-year-old child with a valid driver's license to drive his car because he's been driving irresponsibly. Non-parents don't have that right because they're not parents. Or you might argue the handicapped have a right to an elevator. Why? Because they're handicapped. In other words, rights depend on what it is. The easiest move for the pro-choicer to make at this point is some form of skepticism. Well, that's dogmatic. We really don't know human nature. We don't know what is. My two replies to that are, until we started to argue about abortion, you did think that you knew what things were. And in all other analogous moral areas, you act as if you do. And secondly, if you don't, then don't shoot. Well, I've shot. I ask at this point for questions. Yes. I know you didn't intend to do this, but you emphasize belief in knowing what human nature is and that human, humans have rights. And it seems to be a sort of vague question when giving, when telling us that humans have rights because of persons and the persons because of humans, etc. So what? This is about belief. This is about knowledge. Which one are we talking about? We're talking about... The last board? The last. Okay, fine. How could we demonstrate to someone that persons have the dignity that is worthy of rights? By analogy with what they will already admit. Almost everybody will, in some cases, admit that. For instance, suppose you're so ugly that you make me sick and you make me vomit and throw up. Do I have a right to kill you? (laughs) That's a reason. That's a reason. It's not arbitrary. It depends on... Nobody would say yes. I don't know. Some some consistent pro-abortionists would say yes. I don't think so. I've never heard one. Nobody wants to say that killing a human being is trivial. They want to say that abortion is trivial. So they want to say that somehow abortion is less than killing a human being. They argue. I don't know. There there are current philosophers that that argue like the protection of some like pets and stuff would be more important than, you know, a crippled human. Yeah, Peter Singer. Yeah, Singer. Yeah. He's the most famous philosopher in America. How would we deal with him? You know, you got me there. I must admit that after his famous article got circulated, I think it was in the New York Times Sunday Supplement, but uh, millions of people read it. It was a very shocking thing. He argued, basically, that uh, it's okay to kill grandma. And he said that parents ought to have a 30-day warranty on babies that they get from the hospital. If they don't like the baby, they should be able to kill it for 30 days because in all other stuff, you can bring it back. And you're not saddled with a lemon car, so why you should be saddled with a lemon kid? A very shocking article. Now, what the New York Times publishes usually elicits a lot of letters of response. A Lexus Nexus search for the next week discovered zero responses to that. Zero.